All right, thanks, Dean. Um, so like you mentioned, my name is Miss Selena. I am the technical sales engineer here at Antec Controls. Um, so today we are in in our few months, and I'll be talking about precision airflow devices. So just to start off with some um, background with Antec Controls and Price Industries. Um, so many of you may know us as Price Critical Controls. Um, we started about 10, uh, almost 11 years ago now. And it was Antec Control. Um, so that was just a little bit of market differentiation in the market. Um, but we are the, the same company, Price Control Controls, Antec Controls. Uh, we're all one. And, and our main goal is to maintain pressurization in critical spaces like laboratories, but also health. In order to maintain pressurization and control the direction of airflow um, from clean to less clean spaces, we have a line of airflow control devices that you can see behind me, um, and also a little bit of controls that we'll talk more about on Thursday. Um, so just to get started here, behind me, um, we have three different types of airflow control devices. Uh, we have a, uh, just a standard VAV box right here, um, or just a terminal unit. We have a high accuracy terminal unit uh, in the middle. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the different types of high accuracy terminal units in the market with a little bit of a comparison. Um, these do differ quite, uh, quite a bit uh, in the market depending on the manufacturer. Uh, and then we have uh, the Venturi valve here. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about each of their technologies, how they work, their typical applications. Um, and then we'll move on to talk a little bit about the competition, what else is in the market and try and group those different types of valve technologies into these uh, three categories. Um, and then we'll take a little short break before heading over to our Venturi valve wall, where we'll do a full demo with, um, with running air to show just the, the operation, how exactly the Venturi valve works and the benefits of it in lab design and lab spaces. So just to start off with, This is a terminal unit. I think most of you guys are familiar with it or also refer to it as a VAV box. Um, so this will refer to as a closed loop type of device. Um, and we also refer to it as mechanically pressure dependent. Um, so touching on the closed loop aspect of it, you can see that there is some sort of pressure measurement at the inlet. Um, and there, in this case, it, typically a VAV box will have a cross flow sensor. So a cross flow sensor is measuring the total pressure uh, and then also the static pressure and then using, uh, subtracting one from the other and using then velocity pressure to calculate airflow. Velocity, uh, pressure and airflow are then related using what we call a K factor or just a specific constant for uh, each size valve. And that K factor is then adjusted in the field when you're doing balancing um, to scale the, the valve accordingly. Now we are doing taking that uh, direct pressure measurement. We're taking that pressure measurement, relaying that back to the controller. That controller is then determining whether the airflow that it's measuring is at its target or not. And if it's not at its target, it's gonna move the actuator a specific position and move that damper blade to adjust in order to maintain the target airflow. So once that happens, that again is a closed loop because it's taking that measurement, it's feeding that back to the controller, it's then moving the damper blade if needed, and then measuring, comparing, moving, measuring, comparing, moving. And again, that is that closed loop system that we're talking about with the terminal unit. Um, another uh, thing that I use, another language I use to describe this is mechanically pressure dependent. And that's because this device, if we were to take the controls and take the actuator off of it, and we just fix a damper blade at a specific position, as the pressure or the duct pressure increases or decreases, the airflow would also increase or decrease, again, if the damper blade was fixed. So mechanically pressure dependent. Um, what that also means is that at a specific pressure that we're measuring, we can relate that to a specific airflow, again, through that calculation um, using that K constant, um, that K factor in this device. So, Pressure and um, airflow are directly related. It depends on pressure as a mechanical system. However, you may also hear this device being referred to as electronically pressure independent. And that's because when we toss on some controls, electronic components, controls in an actuator, 
as your duct pressure increases and decreases, this crossflow sensor is going to detect those changes, and then it's going to relay that back to the controller and the actuator, use that closed loop control system, and then move the damper blade to maintain airflow as your duct pressure increases. So um, again, mechanically pressure dependent, but electronically pressure independent. Now, taking a look at a high accuracy terminal unit. A high accuracy terminal unit is essentially just that. It has a lot of the same mechanical components as just a regular terminal unit. It's got some sort of pressure measurement inside, and then it's also got a damper blade on the downstream side, along with some controller um, controlling that damper blade. So similar to a reg regular VAV box, it's also closed loop control taking in some sort of pressure measurement, it's relaying that back to the controller, and then it's telling the actuator whether to move open or close or stay in the same position, and then continues that cycle. It's also mechanically pressure dependent, because again, with this device, you can directly relate pressure and airflow together, um, regardless of what pressure you're at. Now, one of the main differences you'll notice is that we don't use a crossflow sensor in a high accuracy terminal unit. Instead, we use um, these differential static pressure ports. So if I turn this just ever so slightly, you can see that there's one port in the inlet of the valve and then another one closer into the center um, in the throat of the venturi valve. So we're measuring the differential static pressure just the velocity pressure uh, through the device. So this allows us to have a couple benefits. One of the main ones is because we're using differential static pressure, the ports or the holes on the ports are on the back side. Um, so when airflow flows through, through, airflow is not flowing directly into the holes versus a, S, uh, versus a crossflow sensor on a VAV box, which when it measures total pressure, those holes are directly facing the airflow. So it's more prone to get lint and contamination stuck in those pressure ports, um, which may require maintenance over time and will also potentially result in a degradation in your pressure or your airflow signal. Another main difference that you'll notice with a high accuracy terminal unit is the shape of the body. So a typical VAV box or a terminal unit has a constant diameter, whereas a high accuracy terminal unit you can see uses a venturi shape um, body. So what happens here is you can see that there is the second pressure port right in the throat of the valve. We're creating a pressure drop between the two static pressure measurements. And by creating a pressure drop between those measurements, we're essentially amplifying that signal and making it easier to read pressures, especially at lower air flows. Um, so this allows this device, a high accuracy terminal unit, to typically have a turndown of about 10 to 1 versus a typical terminal box, which has a turndown ratio of about 5 to 1. So when you're looking at critical spaces, uh, typically you're going to be looking at either the high accuracy terminal unit or, like I'm going to talk about in a bit, a venturi valve because the accuracy is so important when you're trying to control clean airflow through these spaces. Uh, typically, a VAV box, um, what you'll see in office spaces, uh, hallways, really not critical spaces, um, or even just constant volume applications. So in the past, a lot of the times, operating rooms um, that were just operating at a constant airflow volume, um, they were using uh, terminal units, again, because they're once you balance them at a specific flow, um, they're able to operate accurately. However, terminal units are a little bit more susceptible to, or they're a little bit more sensitive to the installation conditions. Um, so they typically require around three straight ducts into and out of the, the valve itself in order to get a nice laminar flow and a nice accurate reading through that cross flow sensor. Um, but since we're using differential static pressure, we're not really concerned with the profile of airflow. We're just concerned that there's enough static pressure going across the valve in order to get the airflow that we're looking at. So when you're looking at high accuracy terminal units, depending on what you see in the market and depending on the type of pressure um, or airflow signal they're using, um, they typically don't require any straight duct requirements. But if they do, it's usually only about one, again, for high accuracy terminal units. 
Uh, and again, because we're using differential static pressure uh, in these uh, critical spaces, especially in labs on fume hoods, if there is a potential for those chemicals to produce any condensation, um, having a device that doesn't necessarily, um, or that is more resistant to that type of um, contamination is really beneficial. So the next valve we're going to look at is a venturi valve. So the venturi valve is going to be completely different than a regular high accuracy terminal unit or even just a uh, terminal unit itself. So a venturi valve is what we refer to as open loop control versus a high accuracy terminal unit or a regular terminal unit, which we refer to as closed loop control. And the reason being, with a venturi valve, we're not actually measuring airflow in this device. So what we're doing is we are actually, we're taking a factory calibrated curve that maps the position of this entire cone spring assembly connected to this um, actuator lever, lever connected to the actuator. And we're using that position to map to a specific airflow. So for instance, this position that this uh, actuator is at could be at 500 CFM. But if I were to clutch this actuator and move this entire assembly, let's say close, move it closer uh, to the throat of the valve, that could be targeting, let's say, a CFM based on uh, the output from the actuator. So again, we are looking at a specific position and relaying that back uh, to a specific airflow. Um, and that is, again, it's factory calibrated. Um, it's not measured in the field. Um, so that's what we refer to as open loop. So once it hits that position, it's not going to try and make small adjustments. It knows based on the actuator voltage that it's at the right position. Now that comes with a couple of conditions um, that I'll address here. The first one is the operating pressure. So for that calibration curve, we do ramp the pressure up and down within a specific uh, pressure range. Uh, typically, uh, medium pressure valves for a venturi valve will be 0 0.63, um, and a low pressure will be 0 0.3 to 3. So taking a medium pressure valve, for example, uh, 0 0.6 to 3, we're going to ramp the pressure up and down within that range, and then we're going to open and close the actuator at each pressure position as well, and that creates that curve that we're looking at. And that pressure range that I mentioned, again, for a medium pressure, 0 0.6 to 3, that 0 0.6 inches defines right when that spring gets becomes engaged, um, and that 3 inches defines right before that spring completely compresses on itself. Um, so that spring is always operating within a specific design range. It's not going to be overly compressed, and it's also not going to be overly stretched um, in its operation. And as long as that valve is seeing that differential static pressure across that valve within the operating pressure range, we can guarantee that that airflow curve or that characterization curve is accurate to plus or minus 5%. So as a part of that, because the operating pressure range is so crucial to the operation of this valve, we are still measuring that differential pressure. So there is a port on the um, outlet and on the inlet of the valve. Um, now this pressure, this differential static pressure, isn't being used for control. Again, it's just being used for monitoring to let you know whether your valve is within its proper operating range. Uh, the second thing that we, or uh, the second factor that we use to uh, monitor um, the device, but again, not used for control, is a potentiometer. So under this little uh, silver bracket, there is a potentiometer that's tied directly to the position of this cone spring assembly. So that potentiometer provides electronic flow feedback as to where the true position of this entire cone spring assembly is. Um, and that's one, it's good for airflow feedback when you're looking at your entire room calculation for offset, but it's also beneficial in terms of troubleshooting so you can determine whether there's actually anything blocking um, the entire cone spring assembly from moving. Um, the last thing I'll mention here about a venturi valve um, is that it is mechanically pressure independent. So I mentioned that the uh, high accuracy terminal unit and a typical VAV box is mechanically pressure dependent. Um, so that's because this venturi valve is made up of two mechanical devices, uh, a high accuracy terminal unit and a regular VAV box. The only mechanical system that's moving is the damper blade. 
In this case, we have the entire cone spring assembly attached to the lever, um, like I mentioned or that I showed earlier. That's one mechanical system. The second mechanical system is this cone spring assembly on the inside. So I'll just open it up a little bit there just so you can see me um, move the cone spring assembly a little bit. But if, um, if you have a change in airflow target, your actuator is going to move just like I showed there. Now, when you have changes in duct static pressure, what's going to happen is, your, let's say your duct pressure increases, it's going to push on this cone spring assembly and reduce the open area that is allowed for airflow to flow through which will in turn balance out and allow you to maintain airflow. So you can see here when I push on this cone spring assembly, the actuator isn't moving. Um, all that's happening is that spring is compressing and it's just reacting to a balance of forces. So one of the benefits of that is that it is virtually instantaneous, again, to specifically to changes in duct static pressure, which is really beneficial in lab spaces with lots of fast acting fume hoods, um, especially when they're all ducted together on one manifold. So having that virtually that instantaneous change speed of response with changes in duct static pressure, again, is really beneficial because if one person was at one hood changing or opening closing their sash, you can guarantee that it's not gonna affect the other individuals at other fume hoods um, because this is acting virtually instantaneous. If you had a high accuracy terminal unit instead, um, in lab spaces, they're still able to control airflow into and out of the space, but the time it takes to reach that final airflow may just take a little bit longer because it does need to do that measuring, moving, measuring, checking, and that continuous closed loop cycle. So again, a Venturi valve is mechanically pressure independent um, because regardless of changes in duct static pressure, that cone spring assembly allows it to maintain airflow while the actuator and the controller is fixed. So the controller is not actually doing any measurement in that case. That cone is just reacting to the forces in your system. Um, so because of that, the Venturi valve, it's also very difficult to relate pressure and airflow directly together. So for a, um, for a high action terminal unit and a regular standard VAV box, you can take a pressure um, and know what airflow you're gonna get. Alternatively, you can also measure, uh, have a specific airflow and know what your differential pressure, your static pressure is going to be. But with the Venturi valve, because we have this second mechanical system, that cone spring assembly uh, operating independently, it's not going to be as simple as relating a specific airflow to pressure. We just need a, that specific operating pressure range. So when you are uh, designing for venturi valve speed in your system, we typically recommend about one inch across the valve um, just to account for any losses. So now I'm going to move on to talk a little bit about um, the other valves in the market. And again, we're not here to tell you that one is better than the other. We're just here to uh, educate on what the different types are that are available and kind of group them into these categories, mostly the high accuracy terminal unit and the venturi valve as well. So starting off here, we have the Phoenix Controls valve. This is a true Venturi valve as well, just similar to the last one that I showed. It's open loop, it, it uses open loop control, and it's mechanically pressure independent. So it's got that cone spring assembly inside as well, just to, to allow for that mechanical pressure independence. And it's got this lever arm that you can see here, moves that entire assembly into and out of the valve to control for airflow. When you're looking at venturi valves in the market, most of them in terms of the mechanical aspect themselves are going to be very similar in how they operate. The main difference that you're gonna see is really on the control side. And we're not gonna talk too much about the control side today. We're gonna to touch a little bit more about that on Thursday. Um, but one of the main differences um, that I mentioned earlier is the differential pressure reading across the valve itself. So the anti-controls venturi valve, we do provide a true pressure reading like I showed, that differential pressure reading across um, the entire valve just to see what that operating pressure range is and just to ensure that we are operating again within the um, acceptable pressure range to allow plus or minus 5%. 
whereas typically on a Phoenix controls valve, you'll see more of a pressure switch uh, versus just a pressure reading. So a pressure switch will essentially allow you to uh, see whether your valve is within range or not range. And again, there's no, pro, um, no one is not better than the other. Having a true pressure reading allows you to have a little bit more visibility of your system over time, especially if you want to, um, your focus is on energy savings and you want to do fan static reset to potentially uh, turn down your fan if your valve are operating a little bit higher. But on the other side, having just a simple switch allows a little bit more simplicity in your system and that you don't need to double check whether you have a low or medium pressure valve. You just know whether you're in pressure or out the pressure range. So that's the Venturi uh, valve from Phoenix Controls. Looking at the airflow control valve from Siemens now, you'll notice that this also uses a cone spring assembly. You can see the cone spring assembly on the inside, but you'll also notice that there is a differential pressure measurement at the front. And that's because the Siemens valve, although it is a Venturi valve and it uses a cone spring assembly, it is considered a closed loop valve. What's happening here is you can see that there is an orifice plate, a little lip on the inside of the venturi valve, and there is differential pressure ports uh, on the um, on the inlet and like the downstream side of that orifice plate. So it's measuring the differential pressure across that orifice plate to, to determine what the airflow is in uh, in the valve, and then using that to move the entire cone spring assembly accordingly. It's then using the cone spring assembly to uh, adjust for any small changes in the jack pressure. So again, a venturi valve that's using closed loop control, not open loop like the venturi or the anti controls valve. So one of the disadvantages to be closed with controlled venturi valve is the fact that, of course, with any type of pressure measurement, um, there's always room or there's always potential at risk for contamination, uh, which may require maintenance over time. So moving on to the critical room controls valve. or the CRC valve that, I, that you may be familiar with, you'll notice that this is more similar to a high accuracy terminal unit um, that I showed, that was the second valve I showed earlier. So a closed loop control where it's taking some sort of airflow measurement. In this case, it's also static pressure measurement, except instead of using the ports down the diameter of the valve, it's using static pressure ports around the circumference that you can see by this black tape here. And again, it has a pressure port on the inlet, and and one on in the stroke as well. So it's still using that venturi sheet to amplify that pressure drop so that we can it can make it easier to read that pressure and measure pressure at lower air flows. Again, it has a damp blade as well, um, mechanically pressure dependent. Uh, now, one thing I mentioned with the anti-controls high action terminal unit is that it doesn't have any straight duct requirements. That's the same for this case as well for the uh, critical room controls valve. The only thing you just want to keep in mind is that this assembly is a little bit longer. It is taking into account that straight duct requirement into the actual the valve assembly itself. So that's that straight duct requirement right before uh, the static pressure sensors. The last valve we'll talk about today is the ACU valve from Accutrol. So this is considered a closed loop type of valve as well, but you'll notice it looks a little bit different. So instead of having a just a standard damper blade at the back, it's actually made up of two damper blades um, near the back that kind of act more as a butterfly damper. Um, and then instead of a pressure measurement or differential step pressure measurement, this device uses vortex shedding. So vortex shedding is essentially a phenomenon where there is a, um, a barrier in the airflow stream. So you can see here that the airflow is being split by this barrier in the center. Um, and then further down in each chamber, there is a smaller sensor, um, circular sensor that you can see there. So that smaller circular sensor is the vortex shutter. And what's happening is in that sensor, there's a post and the airflow is moving across that post and creating a vortices or it's creating a little bit of turbulence after that post. Those vortices or those vibrations are being measured um, and being related to airflow. So essentially the more vertices that are shed, uh, the more vertices and vibrations that are measured, the higher the airflow. 
And that's how this operation works. Um, one of the benefits of it is that um, it can be uh, or is uh, marketed as a potentially uh, very accurate as well, not necessarily more accurate than um, critical room controls or anti controls, so plus or minus 5%. Um, but because there is a device directly in the airflow stream, AccuValve does provide um, a, um, a port or a way to maintain the valve. So this is essentially just a drawband clamp around the valve itself where you can loosen it up and there's a little slot that you can stick your hand into um, and help uh, either clean off the sensors or replace the sensors if needed. Um, so they do provide that uh, if required. Um, but again, with all closed loop control devices where you're actively measuring pressure, uh, it is a risk where you will get buildup of lint, contamination um, that could affect the signal of um, your airflow. Uh, so with that being said, I'll talk a little bit about the competitor valves there and also the different types of valve technologies. We'll move on to our Venturi valve wall that demonstrates that mechanical pressure independence and talk a little bit more about the benefits of that in a lab space. Um, so we'll be back in about five minutes. So feel free to grab coffee um, or uh, just take a quick break or stretch from your um, from your seat and we'll uh, we'll see you soon. All right, welcome back everyone. Thank you for coming back and uh, joining us for the second half of this demonstration. So what I have here behind me, again, I'm still in the Price Research Center North. Uh, but what we have is a Venturi valve wall with um, running airflow, just to show the mechanical pressure independence of the Venturi valve. Um, and the, the benefits of having that with a fast acting or a fume hood space um, with lots of, of fume hoods in there. So um, this setup here, we've got a Venturi valve on both this top and the bottom. We're just going to focus on these top two valves here. You'll notice that this top one is silver, whereas this one's kind of coated in a brown um, type of coating. So the silver one is bare aluminum. Uh, all the uh, anti-controls Venturi valves, both um, Venturi valve and Mike to terminal units are, co uh, are just bare aluminum. Um, with some stainless steel hardware. Um, but then for corrosive applications, we also have a phenolic coating available, which is the brown that you see here. So in this case, you can see the cone um, and the valve body. Everything that's uh, made out of aluminum is coated in a phenolic or a parasite coating. Um, but then all the in internal stainless steel. So if you're looking for something that's had the equivalent uh, corrosion resistance as stainless steel, your phenolic class one is going to be your go-to. Uh, so usually in lab spaces, your supply, your general exhaust, and um, typically your equipment exhaust, so snorkel, um, even biosafety cabinets, depending on what's in um, or what it's exhausting, um, is going to be fine with just your aluminum. Now to add a little bit of cost, of course, you're going to need phenolic coating um, in those corrosive applications, and typically your class one here uh, is going to be uh, the default for majority of, of fume hoods in uh, up there in different projects. Uh, there are different types of uh, coating also available. So in some cases where a little bit more corrosion resistance is required, uh, we can coat all the internal stainless steel hardware in Teflon. And then for even more chemically corrosive applications, uh, there's also a Kynar coating out there or PVDF uh, type coating. Um, it's a little bit more, it, it covers a broader spectrum of different chemicals um, depending on the application. Um, again, that coating will really depend on the types of chemicals going through the hood, um, the frequency that they're being used, and also even the concentrations that they're being used at. So that's the valve themselves. Talking a little bit more about the setup, each of these uh, do have an actuator attached to the linkage along with um, the module here that scores that characterization curve, that factory calc screen. There is a screen above me. We will look at that a little bit later. Um, just to look at some values, um, we, that calibrated airflow that we're looking at is coming directly from this factory calibrated curve. Um, and then we also have a crossflow sensor downstream of the valve. So right downstream here, 
we have uh, an SB300 or a cross-flow sensor that we're using as a reference sensor. Um, so again, we're using that reference sensor because the trade-offs don't actively measure the pressure um, in the system, but we're using that in this case uh, just to see that we can meet that plus or minus 5% in this system. You wouldn't typically need that in a real case scenario um, or on a actual job site. Again, this is just used for demonstration purposes. Um, and then when we look at the screen in a little bit, we'll also see the, the flow comparison. And that's just the difference between the reference uh, and the calibrated airflow. And we're just looking to make sure that it's within plus or minus 5%. So, with that being said, I am going to start to turn on the airflow, so it might get a little bit loud. I'm going to try and speak up, but if you guys have any trouble hearing me, just uh, mention it in the chat or in the questions, and I'll, uh, I'll raise the, my, uh, my volume. So right now what's happening is I'm increasing, I just started and turned on the fan here, and each of these valves is operating at about one inch. Um, right now we're targeting about 350 at this top valve and about 250 CFM on this uh, middle valve here. Um, but what I'm going to do in this first demonstration is I'm going to increase that pressure to about two inches. You're going to hear a little bit get a little bit louder, um, but you'll see this cone spring assembly adjust accordingly um, in response to that change in fan pressure or that duct static pressure. What you're also going to notice is that this actuator doesn't move at all. And if you're having any trouble um, seeing whether the actuator is moving out or not, another frame of reference is going to be this entire uh, assembly here. So this shaft is connected directly to the actuator. So if this doesn't move, the actuator isn't moving. If it does move, of course the actuator is moving. And this so all we're doing is changing the duct static pressure. This should stay in the exact same position. We're going to be looking at this cone inside both of these to see if they move as well. So I'm going to increase the pressure here to about two inches. Again, we're still within the 0 0.6 to 3 inches at operating range, so we should still have um, our, our airflow be plus or minus 5%. So you can see there that that valve, or that cone spring assembly, sinks further into the front of the valve. You'll notice that uh, because we're increasing the pressure, we want to decrease the allowable airflow or decrease the open area, so that's why it sinks further in. Now I'm going to lower the pressure again, and you'll see the cone spring assembly sink further out of the throat. And I'll try to use my finger as a reference because this, the change is a little bit small. So you can see that post we move, you'll notice that this shaft and of course the actuator still did not change. Now we'll pan up to the screen um, so you can see the actual numbers and the values that's happening at the exact same time. So here you can see we're looking again at the top two valves, um, and that first, that first value on each of the valves is going to be your pressure drop. And that's the specific pressure across the valve. Then we have our reference airflow that's coming from that crossflow sensor downstream. And we also have the calibrated airflow feedback, which is coming from um, the module itself here. And then, of course, the flow comparison, making sure that's within plus or minus 5%. I'm going to increase the pressure again, and you're going to see that pressure drop increase to about two inches. But you'll notice that the uh, flow comparison is going to stay within plus or minus five percent. So now we're at two inches, and you can see that the flow comparison again, the comparison between actual airflow and the calibrated airflow is within plus or minus again five percent. Now I'm going to show another demonstration here. We're going to go back to the valves. All right. So what's going to happen here is I'm going to cap off this middle valve. So this middle valve 
I'm going to close it and treat it as if it's more of a realistic scenario, um, like a fume hood. Um, so in a fume hood application, let's say we have two of these fume hoods manifolded on the same duct, the same exhaust, uh, and I'm going to close one of the fume hoods. So what's going to happen here is this cone, of uh, the both cones, springs, uh, springs assemblies, are going to adjust instantaneously. So in the previous example, I wrapped the pressure up and down. Um, you can see the cone change a little bit slower. Um, and that's that, again, is a realistic application, but when we look at an instant change in the duct pressure, you'll see just how quickly that cone adjusts. And it doesn't try and make small adjustments accordingly or anything like that. It's just going to move right away. So I'm going to close this cap. And you'll see very closely, you'll see this cone uh, spring assembly adjust, but again, the actuator is still not moving because the only thing that's changing right now is our duct pressure. All right, so you can see this one sink further into the valve. This one, because we're capping off, it does sink a little bit further out of the valve. So I'll pull it out again, and you'll see the valves return to their normal positions. One more time. And again, that's mechanical pressure independence. Now, we'll take a look at the screen above that shows another type of visual of the exact same demonstration. So what we have here are a couple graphs. The one at the top and just the green, that's going to be our static pressure in the system, um, specifically in the top valve. And then on the bottom one, we have the reference airflow of each of the valves. So you can see this green one here is what we're going to focus on. That's going to be this top valve. The valve that I'm capping, this middle one on the bottom here, that's going to be the red one. So that's a little hard to see, but if you follow my finger there, that's going to be that red line that you see there. So what's going to happen when I cap this valve off, you'll see that it already kind of happened earlier. But what's going to happen is that airflow is going to drop because we are, again, we're capping that valve so no airflow is losing pressure. But you'll notice that that green line stays relatively stable. It's not like a terminal unit or a high action terminal unit where it has to re-measure, uh, where it, uh, it needs to measure and then compare and adjust the damper blade and to make, make small adjustments to get back. It's just going to adjust, again, that cone springs assembly instantaneously, so you won't see any fluctuations in that reading. So I'm going to close the cap right now, and you're going to see that red line drop. I'll try to use my finger as a reference so it's easier to see, but that's that red line right there. You can see that airflow dropping, but you'll see that that green airflow, again, this top valve, uh, responds instantaneously and remains pretty much constant. So again, that's mechanical pressure independence. For the most part, that's why we recommend having venturi valves in lab spaces because they can respond so quickly to uh, fast acting fume hoods in these spaces. And again, not only on the fume hoods, but on the supply and general exhaust so that they're tracking what's happening at the fume hoods in order to maintain your negative space in lab, lab applications. Um, with that being said, uh, high accuracy terminal units can also be used in lab applications. Um, they'll still be able to have the same accuracy, plus or minus 5%, um, but the only difference is, is that because they are closed loop, they do uh, adjust uh, to maintain airflow, so it may take a little bit longer to reach your uh, desired airflow when you have changes in duct static pressure. So maybe in smaller labs you could use a higher C terminal unit, but definitely in larger labs where you have a lot of variable volume fume hoods manifolded together, you probably want to use your venture valves.